praise God. Praise God. We're happy to be here. Thank you so much for welcoming us. Um, we were here yesterday and witnessed a wedding, and that was a blessing in itself. Praise God. Pastor's daughter got married. Glory to God. And um, we're excited. We're excited to be here. We're excited to share this service together. And we really uh, just pray that God can bless this time that we have here. And as mentioned, we're from Great Commission Missionary School um, down south, a whole four hours, or no, I'm sorry, like two and a half hours, four hours from Bellingham, two and a half hours south. So not too far, we're basically neighbors. And um, praise God. It's, it's awesome that we can come here together, unite to worship God together as a church, as the body of Christ, and give God glory together. So I am looking forward to that. Um, my name is Dima Telega. I'm one of the counselors at the missionary school. By God's grace, I've been able to serve there for um, almost two and a half years, almost. But it's been an awesome time, um, truly the best uh, time of my life, super blessed. And uh, that's where I came to know God personally, and that is, it is an amazing thing. But I'll be sharing a, a short sermon with you guys and a short word. And um, what I wanted um, to ask you guys before even getting into it, is who's ever been distracted or say who's ever started something and didn't finish it okay whoever started to raise their hand and didn't finish raising it <laughs> i'm pretty sure that everybody has started something none of you guys are so productive that you guys have never never not finished anything i don't believe it um <laughs> but that's the truth is is there we we start things right and sometimes we don't finish them and why does that happen distractions yes there we go we get distracted right or we begin to focus on something else. We begin to focus on something else. So in a sense, everybody's focused, but what you're focused on is what matters. And, um, you know, we're living in this time right now where there is so much things wrestling for your attention. There are so many things that are trying to tell you to focus on it, to invest your time into this place, invest your time over here, you know, focus on me, either people or things, phones, whatever it is, everything's trying to take your attention and tell it to focus there. And that's what we're living in. We're living in this age where I believe the enemy is using a new tactic and, well, I think he's been using it for some time, but, but so prevalently now, and that is he's distracting Christians. He's distracting believers from the faith. And he's waving things in their faith and he's stealing their time and he's stealing their life and he's stealing their joy. And I want to talk about a focused faith. I want to talk about a faith that endures a faith that does not get distracted easily. And that is what's important. That is what is important to this young generation, I believe. Our generation, if we don't get our focus back, we're going to go and end up into some place where we shouldn't have been going in the first place. You know, how does a thief work? How does, it say, a pickpocket work when he wants to take something from you? He distracts you, right? Sneaky. He says sneaky. That's how the enemy works. He says that he's a thief, right? He's a liar. It says that he came to what? To kill and to destroy and to steal from us. And a thief, he'll bump into you. And by the time you know your purse is gone, something valuable to you has just left. He distracted you for a moment. He shines something flashy in your face. You think that your focus goes there for a mere second. And before you know it, your wallet's gone. Something valuable to you just got lost. And that's how a thief works. And that's how the enemy is working in this time right now. He's not working so directly as sometimes before. But he's working in a sneaky way and trying to distract you with so much information, so much things that you don't need, your phones, your friends who, who just keep drawing you deeper and deeper away from God. Anything to get you to focus off Christ. That's what he's trying to do. And he's trying to steal your time, steal your joy, steal your peace, and steal your faith from you. And I want us to turn. I want us to turn to Hebrews uh, 12, 1 through 3. And please do not be distracted right now. Please get off your phones, at least for these next two hours. Don't let the enemy steal the word that is supposed to be planted into your heart. Be of good soil. You know who I'm talking to. I know there's someone out here on their phone. They probably didn't even catch the first part, but it's okay. Hear it now. You, there's a live stream. I think they'll have a replay button um, just in case. So please, focus, focus, focus. Um, so Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, these verses have the key to living a focused life of faith. The key to living a life that 
with a faith that endures, not a faith for a season, not a faith that things are going good and that's it. No, a faith that's genuine, a faith that's tested. It says your faith will be tested. In fact, there will be a time in every single person's life where your faith has to be proven as real, real faith. Real faith lasts. Real faith endures. Hebrews 12, uh, 1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily tri trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. It says, let us, because there's, there's such a big crowd of witnesses, it says, from the life of faith. There are so much people who watch you every single day, co-workers, people you're at school, people who have already moved on, but the, the angels are watching. God is watching. There is a huge crowd of witnesses to your life of faith, right? And it says, therefore, since we are being watched, right, let us strip aside every single what? Weight, right, and sin. So there's two things. It's not just sin. There's weight. That means there are things you're trying to run with and walk in your Christian faith that isn't sin, but it ain't helping you get closer to God. It's holding you back. And there are many things that can be holding you back. Things that can be used in the right way, but when they're used wrongly, they don't excel you in your faith. They don't push you forward into a relationship with God. In fact, they take you away from being able to walk in faith. They distract you. What can some of those things be? What can be, say, a weight in our life? Phone. What else? I don't want to be talking at you guys. I want to be talking with you guys. I believe when we're here, when we're a church, we're a community, we're supposed to talk with each other. Right? Amen? Amen. Amen. Friends. Social media. The gym. Relationships, sometimes with people. Food. Talk about that, man. Food. Come on. Some of you guys are distracted with food right now. Your, your tummy's rumbling. Um, what else? Work. Yeah, money. Yeah, absolutely. These things are all right. These things are all right. These are weights, right? If they're not used rightly, right? If your friendship is not used in the right way, the way that God has made it to build each other up, it says iron sharpens iron as a man sharpens a man. If that's not the case, if your friend is, uh, I don't know, if he's a rock and he's doling you, then probably he's not a good friend, you know? If he's not sharpening you, if he's making you dumber, he's distracting you. You know, if he's filling you up with a bunch of alcohol and weed, he's distracting you. Believe me, he's not drawing you closer to God. If he's popping a bunch of pills with you, he's not drawing you closer to God. That's the reality of it. I know I went through a life like that. You know, I'm not just talking out of just, no. I know in our church, in our young generation, there are young people who do these things. There are young people who do these things and they're distracted. And, you know, if your friend is calling you to parties, believe me, he's a distraction. You got to get rid of him. You got to lay aside every weight. If that means breaking friendships, so be it. For the glory of God, for you to keep your faith. For you to keep what God has given you, that gift of eternal life that he's given you. That is what's important. That relationship that he's given you, that is what's important. More important than all these things that we think are good for us. Same thing with your phone. It's a great tool. It's an awesome tool. It keeps you connected with people, but... It can be used in the wrong way. It can be used to bring anxiety into your life. It can be used to bring so much distraction in your life. It can take hours out of your day, completely unproductive hours out of your day, hours that you could have dedicated to getting to know God. Imagine if you checked on your phone. I know you guys have it. You can do it tonight. You know, see how, how much you used your phone on this Sunday. And, you know, f and don't make excuses that I had no time to, you know, have some personal time with God today. Because when you check how much time you've spent on your phone doing a bunch of nonsense, believe me, all of us have time to see God. What we do with our time, where we're focused at, is what matters. So many things, they're good. They're great things, but we just have to put them in the right place. We can't make them be a weight in our life. It's like, my idea of this is like, it's saying it's a race, right? To run. Wait, imagine this, you know, you know, back in the day, or I don't know, I don't know if they do it now, but you know that, that ball and a chain that they gave for prisoners, what's that there for? So you don't get away, so you don't run. 
Um, and that's how some of us are right now. We're crippled Christians. We have this big old ball. We're dragging along, walking in this faith. But we have this weight tied to our, to our leg. How long are you going to endure before you're going to get exhausted and drop? It's a marathon. It says it's, a, it's a race of endurance. So I want us to, tonight, to not wait till tomorrow to carry this nasty ball around, but get rid of it tonight. When the Holy Spirit is reaching out to you and tugging to you and saying, hey, look, you got to put this away. You got this friend who's a distraction to you, this weight, you know, who always pulls you away, who draws you into this place where you're so-called having fun and every single day you go back empty, disappointed, depressed, and then you pretend and you smile the next day like everything's good and you do it again on the weekend, you do it again. That's what you need to get rid of. That's a weight. And some of it's weight, some of it's sin. Um, it says this, get rid of the sin that so easily trips you up. You know, that weight is that weight, right? It's tied to your leg. But there's a sin. That is, that is more than just that. That calls for repentance and turning away because that is going against God in every single way possible. Going against who he's called you to be and he's called you to be pure and holy through his son, Jesus Christ. And that is, is more than just that. That is, that is something that's when you're running has just popped up there. You know, we've seen some people hurtling and, and they hit that hurdle hard and they fall. That's sin, you know, or a pothole or something like that. And you fall it's going to hurt, and it makes it hard for you to get up. And that sin gets completely in the way of your walk of faith. Your walk, your ability to endure, your ability to be the light does not exist when you're walking in sin. It says if, you're, if, you're, if your light is darkness, you know, how can you be walking in the light? How can you be walking in truth? How can you be an example if you're walking in sin? That is something that has to be cut out, and we have to repent and turn back to God's grace, to God's truth, and to his word, and walk in faith. And um, it says this also. It says, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. To run with endurance. It's not saying that we just got to sprint for 100 meters and call it good. No, this is a marathon. Our walk with faith is not some kind of faith for a season. It's a faith for your lifetime. Your commitment to Christ, that day you got baptized, if you have been baptized, you proclaim to this world that I'm done going back. I died to that life. My commitment, my full allegiance is to God in this life, going into forever. Not for a season, not if it feels good, not if it's all right, not if God's blessing me with a bunch of things. But no, even through the hard times, even through the trials, even through the times where it's hard to breathe, in those moments, you made a commitment to God. Your faith is for a lifetime, not for a season. Doesn't matter what season you're going through, God will get you through that season. He's faithful. It says that, you know, no temptation, that no test has overcome you that is uncommon to man. But with it, God is faithful to what? Provi provide a way out. So through any season, God will help you through. And our job is to remain faithful to him and to be the light to this world. And how do we do this? You know, that sounds good. There's a lot of things. But how do we do this? We do this, it says in verse 2. It says we do this by what? By keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. So how do we live a life of endurance? We keep our eyes focused on the right place. We keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. When you focus on Jesus Christ, you're not going to get misled very easily. When you focus on the right thing, if you're focusing on your wallet, the pickpocket's not going to be able to take it, right? The thief is not going to be able to take that which God has given to you if you're focusing on Christ because he will fulfill you. He will give you the discernment. He will give you the wisdom and the strength to endure in this life and to finish what you have started. It says the author means he started it. He will finish it for you. He's a perfecter of your faith till that day where you stand before him. And we will stand before him, every single one of us. We'd be delusional to think that we won't be. And may God give us the strength. May God give us that ability to focus on him, to not get distracted. You know, we're all focused on something. Just the matter is what? What are you focused on? Are you focused on Christ? Otherwise, your, your fuel is going to burn out. So focus on Christ. It says he endured the cross, disregarded the shame. Why? Because he knew what was awaiting him. Do you know what's awaiting you? Do you understand the joy 
of knowing Christ, the joy of stepping into his glorious kingdom on that day for eternity. Our eyes need to be set in the right place. We have to set our eyes on eternity. We have to set our eyes on Christ. And we will be able to endure. And these things that we count as fun, all of a sudden we count them all as lost. It's all garbage. You realize what God has brought before you, the joy that awaits you. And you can stay focused. You can stay focused on him through this time. And verse 3 says, think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Interesting. I was reading this. I was like, wow, I've read this so many times. But it, God tells us to think about the, uh, all the hostility that Jesus Christ endured. He's like, think about every single thing that you've done to him. Think about all the things that, that people did to him on that cross. Think about that price that he paid for you. And he says, when you do that, then you won't become weary and give up. He says, when you think about what Christ did for you, you won't grow weary and give up in your lifetime. You know, we still got time to go, especially if you're young, you still got time. And when you're even, even the older generation here, you still have to finish strong. And you do that by keeping your eyes focused on Jesus Christ. And us, we, have a, we still have a, a long time to run and think about what Christ did for you. Don't leave with the heart at heart. If God's speaking to you today, open your heart. Think about what he's done to you. You're not doing yourself a favor by trying to neglect what he's done for you because he's done it. Regardless, it says he died for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners. That's how he showed us his love for us. And that's a wonderful thing. And um, I want to, we, you know, we were, we were singing this song. And we were singing that, you know, I see this generation, you know, that's rising up to take its place. But I want to see that generation that's rising up to take its place. It says with selfless faith. With selfless faith. In all reality, I've been thinking about Christianity as a whole, especially Western Christianity, it's selfish faith. That's what it is. Absolutely self-centered, all about me, 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 me. Where did the servant go? Did God not call us to serve? Right? Isn't service about the other person? Isn't service about my fellow brother? Or is it all about me? Is it the way that I want things? The way that I want service? The way that I feel comfortable? The way that I need to be good? You know, somebody mistreated me. Now it's all, un no, that's, self that's selfish faith. If it's all about me, we completely forgot about Christ. Church was not made just for us. Church was made for that unbeliever who needs to come in here and hear the words of life spoken to him. Selfless faith. The faith that ser servants have. He said, I didn't come to be served. He says, I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. To, to live and to pour our life out for others. That's what we are called to do. To be servants. And I want to read and conclude with this in Joshua 24, 14 through 15. It says this. Uh, Joshua speaks these words. And it says this. So fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the idols your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will, you, will it be the idols, the Amorites in whom land you live in right now? Or is it that which you do right now? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's a question to every single one of you that God is speaking today. As, as you hear, as your ears are open, is choose today whom you will serve. That is the grace of God right now that you have today to choose. That you're alive, that you can make that choice within your heart to say that me and my house will serve the Lord. Not for a season, not for today, but forever. I want to make that decision today to serve God. Regardless of what other people think, me and my house will serve the Lord. That's what we are all called to do today. While It says, while there is still today, while it is there, do not harden your heart. And I think every single one of us have to answer that, that, that question today and choose. Whom will you serve? Will you walk faithfully with God? Make that decision not based on emotions, no, but because of the reality of what Christ did for you. 
because of the reality of his gift of grace in your life, because of the reality of eternity, because of the reality that you did not choose to create yourself and some, some little bacteria didn't inform you because God is a designer and he made you beautiful and unique. Because of that reality, choose today whom you're going to serve. And the fact that God is able to give you hope and joy and peace that this world cannot offer. Absolutely, that this world cannot offer. Peace is in Christ alone. And with that, may God bless you guys. May God bless this church. May God bless this youth to truly be that generation. I really want to see young people here, the young people, even the youngest of the young, you know. I ran into already a kid who's like 14 and he's serving faithfully and that's awesome. But every single person I truly want that is here to not get distracted, to not hit the snooze button, you know. That was something on my list, too, is sleeping. You know, there are people sleeping. I'm not going to say who they are, point any fingers. But uh, the reality is that you can get distracted by sleep. You can sleep all day, you know, and you're going to miss the message. You're going to miss the day and the train's going to leave. Don't get distracted with being lazy and sleepy all the time. Um, focus on God. Give him his time. What God entrusts you with, the talents that he gives you, make sure you bring back with interest for him. Because he gives it to us. So may God bless you guys. May God bless this church. I don't know, maybe we'll pray briefly, yeah, very shortly, and we'll go with the program.